Like I said, this is kind of the arc, the, the middle ground one. So I kind of got to pick my own topic, uh, choose your own venture for this one. So I, uh, which actually is, is a lot harder than it sounds. It's a lot easier to slide into a sermon when someone's kind of got it mapped out for you. But um, here I am. So uh, where, where I want to land this morning is what Jesus are you looking for? What Jesus are you looking for? 2015, Barna did a research, and the research, the title of the article is, What Do Americans Believe About Jesus? 92% of us, relatively, 90% of us, believe that Jesus was real. He's historical, he happened, he was a baby, he grew up, like he was legit, like he actually existed, this dude named Jesus. 56% of us believe that he is God. Um, of those 62%, no, 62% of those have cited a personal relationship with Jesus, and two-thirds of those believe that when they die, they will go to heaven. So relatively speaking, most of us in this room, at least from the numbers, can say that at least believe in Jesus, that he existed. And about half of us are going, I don't really know if he was God. Here is what the president of Barna Group, David Kinman, said after the research. He said that there isn't much argument about whether Jesus Christ was actually a historical person. But nearly everything about his life generates enormous and sometimes rancorous debate. All of us in this room, statistically, would believe in Jesus. My question is, which Jesus do you believe in? The Jesus that you believe in, what do you know about him? What do you think about him? Keller has a quote regarding the deity, the incarnation of Jesus. He says, God became man, the divine son became a Jew, and the God Almighty appeared on the earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie, stare, wriggle, and make noises, needed to be fed and changed and taught to talk like any other child. God, creator of the universe, had to be taught to talk like any of us. So we've been journeying in Luke for the last month or so and culminated on Christmas with the Christmas story. But Luke gives us an insight that none of the other gospels do, and that is actually this, the moment between his birth and the start of his ministry. This is where Jesus gets lost and his parents find him in the temple. And what I want to take this in in-between season while we're between Christmas and New Year and it's, you know, and this in-between season um, where uh, Aaron talked about the already, yet, yet, already not yet, what do we learn about the Jesus in this season of his life? You see, sometimes I think we look at Jesus as having an unfair advantage, right? He was God. So of course he knew everything and did everything well and he was perfect. But the reality is, is that this is Jesus just like you and I. The Spirit didn't fill Jesus until later on, right, to start his ministry. So this is actually Jesus laying down his deity aside, living a life pre-adolescent, underage. And so there's a unique view of his life in this season. And so my question for us this morning is, as we look into this next year, which starts tomorrow morning, as we look into this next year, the question is, what do we learn about this Jesus before he is in ministry? And how does it intersect with your life? What does the life of Jesus compare to your life before his life in ministry? What does it look like and how does it compare? That the God incarnate creator and designer of your heart actually provides an instruction manual. Those of you who, in the room, be proud of me. I did an alliteration as a pastor. These are like requirements as a pastor. You have to do an alliteration. So my alliteration for this morning is simply this. Jesus as a contemplator, Jesus comprehending, and Jesus, just Jesus' commitment. This morning, I want to land on Jesus in contemplation, comprehension, and commitment. So if you're willing and you're able, could you stand up with me? And why don't we read Luke 2 together and the story of Jesus essentially getting lost. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem to the festival of Passover. This is Luke 2, 41. 
When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in company, they traveled on for the day, and they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they, did, uh, when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at the understanding of his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why did you search for me, he asked. Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus, thank you for your word, the life that you lived. And Lord, as we reflect on your life, I pray that you would make clear to us, Spirit of God, that you make clear to us areas in our life where there is discrepancy with your life. Spirit of God, you're welcome in this place. Soften hearts. Lord, let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be pure. Lord, that what lands here today would, la- would do so in, in soil that is rich. And the ways in our view would pass by. Father, you are good to us. Spirit, you are welcome in this place. In Jesus, we're thankful. In your name. Amen. On your seat. Or you can stay standing. That's up to you. That's awkward, though. But... <laughs> the one person just stays standing the whole time. So first off, I think it's important to acknowledge, just acknowledge, that God trusted his son, his son, with this family, in this culture, at this time. I'm not trying to make more of Mary and Joseph. I'm not trying to say there's anything sacred about them. But I think it is worth recognizing that they, they were trusted with the Son of God. They're, they're, like, let's give credit where credit is due. Right? God looked at Mary and Joseph and said, I will entrust you with my baby boy. Okay? So I think that's kind of the premise. What do we learn from that? What do we know from that? Well, first off, he came from a very, very good Jewish family. Um, every year, the family would go uh, to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts. And, and typically, it would be the father and the older sons, if you're above 13. That would be what you would do. You would every year make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Typically, though, you wouldn't bring your 12-year-old boy, and you probably wouldn't bring your wife. That, that's typically not done. But what we're seeing here is that this actually becomes an entire family shindig. Like, that's all of us going somewhere. Like, it was massive. Aunts, uncles, brothers, neighbors. Like, the uncle you don't like and the auntie you can't stand. All of you together are going down this journey towards... So it's... You, what, they're doing them the bare, more than the bare minimum, is what I'm trying to say. Right? Like, the bare minimum was like, just show up and go back home again. No, no. This entire family was heading to Jerusalem, and they're all celebrating this. There's a celebratory nature to what's happening in this massive road trip. In fact, they were even there for a lot longer than they had to be. So I think like we can, we can safely assume they were all in. Now, why did they celebrate feasts? What, like, what was the purpose of these feasts? Feasts in the Old Testament did a couple things for us. First off, they reminded us of God's faithfulness, which means that throughout history and through the ages, God has always shown himself to be faithful. And when there was a significant moment in time, let's say Passover as an example, where God leads leads his people out of Egypt, that is a way for Israel to remember what God had done. So it's to remind God of his faithfulness, but it's also to celebrate the creation and the good order of creation. These feasts continually reminded people that it was okay to celebrate. It was okay to be mindful. It's even like with Sabbath. Like that was the whole thing with Sabbath. People would look forward to Sabbath. It was like a reprieve. It was a day away from everything else where you got to enjoy the blessings that God had given you and get to enjoy being in relationship with 
God. The sages would even say to not enjoy every legitimate pleasure was in essence to be an ingrate before the master of the universe. To not enjoy the pleasures God has given you was tantamount to being ungrateful to God. Jesus' first miracle was at a party, right? I think, I think it, the way we see things in our culture, there's a, there's a dualistic view. We have the mind and we have the material world, or the visible or the invisible, right? And, and we look at the body, it's kind of like in a prison to our spirit. But we, we, we push away all the, all the earthly pleasures only to embrace the, the truth of the spiritual world. And that's really what matters, right? This is a, a platonic way of thinking. And it's, it's actually crept into our ethos. That we, we, uh, we abandon the present joys for the spiritual joys, which really are more important which really is not at all what God has asked of us, not at all what God is saying. In fact, he says, it is good. Creation is good. These things are good. Enjoy them. You are a holistic being. You are one being. You're not separated by spirit and body. You are a being to enjoy the goodness of God. And there should be a celebratory and there should be an, an appreciation and a gratitude for the blessings of life. And so my question is, as you go into your next year, just a thought, but what is your perspective of God? Do you see God as somebody who just welcomes you into a life of joy and gratitude and enjoying the gifts that he's given you and reveling in that? Or is there one where there's a, a taskmaster whipping you from behind saying, work harder, work harder? What, what things in your life do you have to remind you of God's faithfulness? Do you have Sabbath? A practice where you just get to take a week aside and you were reminded week over week over week of God's faithfulness. Let me just say, you know what, Tim? I get, thanks, appreciate that, but you have no idea what I'm going through right now. I just lost, this is my first Christmas without my loved one. Right? Uh, I'm financially drowning, more so than I was before Christmas. Right? Like, like I am just completely underwater financially. Or I've got an ailment in my body, or, or I've been brokenhearted, or, or whatever dot, dot, dot you may have. Look, I don't, I don't belittle that. Please hear me. I don't belittle that. But what I'm saying is, it gives perspective. When you can recognize God's faithfulness and his ask for us to enjoy the good things in life, it changes perspective. It doesn't mitigate. Mitigate. But it does change the way we look at it. So the first Jesus that we have is the Jesus of contemplation. Right? This is the Jesus growing up. He was continually reminded of God's faithfulness. The next one is Jesus of comprehension. I want to go to verse 43 if you join me there. You can read along if you'd like. But after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in, comp in company, they traveled on for the day. They began looking for him among the relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at the understanding of his questions. Okay. No luck. Like, no joke. No, yeah, my oldest son's 13. So like 13 years ago and nine months, when we first found out we're going to have a baby, Legitimately, my fear was I am going to be that parent that's going to leave their kid in like the, the bathroom at like the top of the Coca-Cola and drive away. Like I, I swear I was going to be that parent that was going to leave my kid in the washroom somewhere and completely forget. Like does anybody else have that fear, please? Yes? No? Has anyone actually left their kid? Okay, I actually know that there are some people in this church who have. So like I know who you are. I'm the executive pastor. I know these things legitimate fear like so so like growing up growing up sorry as my kids were growing up like my, my youngest is now six years old so i'm less worried about that now i'm just glad i made it like i'm just glad i made it in fact i did some research for you this is completely free public service announcement if you ever lose your kid this i learned this i looked it up the other day if you were to lose your kid they tell you actually not to yell out your kid's name what you're supposed to do is saying 
and start yelling at the top of your lungs saying, little girl lost, blue shirt, black pants, whatever, and start describing her. And what happens is that other people will hear you and go looking around and go, oh, that must be the kid. But if they don't see him, then they start yelling and you get the spider web of people looking for your kid. That was completely free. Take it or leave it. It's yours. I just wanted to share that with you. I thought it was helpful for me, although a bit late. Okay, so now you have Mary and Joseph. Now, they're going on this massive trip, and, and they lose their kid. They left their kid in the bathroom stall. Like that... I, like the other day, I lost my kid for like two minutes at a store, and I was like, oh my goodness, I'm a harsh, and I got dad mode, and I got, like two minutes. Granted, like, whatever, it, it is what it is, but like two minutes, I got panicky. So they're traveling, and all of a sudden, they're showing up going like, I thought you had him, and like, no, I thought you had him, and all of a sudden, like, fingers start pointing. Can you imagine? Like, the panic that just like, oh my word, like, I, I lost my kid for two minutes, and I felt this way, let alone like, so now they're going looking for this kid for three days. I have no idea how they slept at night. Because I can guarantee you, if I lost my kid, I'm not sleeping at night. I don't think my wife would let me sleep at night. Like, it just isn't happening. So, like, for three days, they're scouring trying to find the kid. Where do they eventually find their son? By the way, I just be clear, the Bible makes no reference of them being an heir. So let's just give them a benefit of the doubt and just not call them poor parents. It happens to the best of us. It's life. It's how things go. Okay, they finally find their kid. He's in the Jerusalem, and he's at the temple. And what's he doing? He's at the temple, and he's, he's sitting there debating, studying. See, in Jesus' culture, study was hugely important. You could say, well, look, Jesus is Jesus, and he had, like, special powers, and he was God, and so of course He's like, no, no, hold on. Jesus had to be taught like anybody else. And in his culture, he was taught that study was important. And we see Jesus here, and he's learning. Learning the will of the Father. See, it's through Scripture that we understand and know the will of the Father. What the heart of the Father is. Everything always comes back to the heart of the Father. And Jesus was sitting there learning the heart of the Father. Any question we have, wherever we're at in life, always comes back to what is the heart of the Father. Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, has this to say about that. Those who wish to focus on the problem of Christians' ethics, so in this case he's talking about ethics, are faced with an outrageous demand. From the outset, must give up the very two questions that lead them to deal with the ethical problem. How can I be good, and how can I do something good? Instead, they must ask a wholly other, complete, different question. What is the will of God? See, knowledge and fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The will of God is the beginning of wisdom. And to know the will of God, you must know the heart of God. And to know the heart of God, you must study his word. So that you can know the will of God. See, this is the book of all books. Sacred writings. This is, this is the main channel through which God's voice is heard. And learning and teaching should be part of every Christian's journey. Remember the spiritual gifts. We talked about some gifts are for some people, not for others. People say, well, teaching's not my gift. Okay, fair enough. But what we also said was, if it's not your gift, it should be a discipline that you're working towards. You see, you can't do the Great Commission without teaching. In your going, make disciples. How do you make disciples? By teaching them. How do you teach them? By knowing the Scriptures. So it's only through knowing the Scriptures that you can teach and make disciples. It's in your going that you're bringing people back to his word and the truth of his word. This is the foundation of the Christian faith, is this corpus, this book of books. And for us to be able to do the Great Commission, we need to know the heart of the Father. Just as Jesus had to know the heart of his Father, we are called to know the heart of our Father. It's a quote, little more than passive satisfaction with seemingly superficial Sunday scanning of scriptures. Let me say it again, because it really burned on my heart. Little more than passive satisfaction with seemingly superficial Sunday scanning of scriptures. Do we look at this as a gift, or do we look at it as something to explore and unpack together? How do you view this? How do you view this? Second point is that he's doing it in a community. 
Jesus was sitting under the teaching of rabbis. Now, in this case, he was like, like, he was good. Like, there was debate happening, and everyone's amazed because, like, his answers. But what was typically happening in this space was that there'd be a question for question. So the rabbi would ask a question, and they would respond with a question, which would respond with another question. And it'd be question over question over question. And if the student could respond with a question, you knew that he knew the answer. This is what was going on. The, the rabbi was holding a master class at, this, at the temple, just sitting outside. And he was inviting people, the, the kind of the intellectual elite who were, were coming in and learning and learning and learning through the teaching. This was your Lord. This was our Lord who was learning under. And so the question is, who is helping you learn? As iron sharpens iron, who's sharpening you? Who's sharpening you in your faith? Who's sharpening you in understanding and digging of scriptures? This was normative for Jesus. The reason he went there is this was normative. So what normative practices do you have in your life? Is the word of God sweet as honey, as Ezekiel says? You know that on the first day of school, when any young student would come into class, the rabbi would put honey on the slate. The students have to lick it off to remind them that the word of God was as sweet as honey. This is the word of God that's as sweet as honey. So what, what do you have in your life, that a community of people around you that's sharpening you? Right? I'm part of a, a group of guys. I call them a consortium of guys. And two of them go to this church and two of them go to another church. Don't worry, I'm trying to get them saved. Um, <laughs> I won't tell you which church. No, I'm sure. But you know what? We come together and we actually just unpack and we, we wrestle through. What, who's in your life that's actually poking at you and prodding at you? Because our theology doesn't always line up. It's like, well, no, that's not what I believe. Well, why? Well, this one. And, and so that there's a debate and there's an argument. There's a wrestling. We're not called to do this in isolation. But what life group, what, what study, men's Bible study or women's Bible study, or even what group of friends do you meet with regularly to unpack the sweetness of his word? What do you have in your life as you move into 2024? And finally... We have the Jesus of commitment. In verse 48, let me read for you. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching. Yeah, no doubt. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Did you not know I had to be at my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying, and he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured these things in her heart. First blush, it kind of sounds like Jesus has a bit of an attitude, doesn't it? It's like, look, lady, don't worry about me. Yet we also know that Jesus never broke any of the commandments. Every one of the commandments, uh, the, the Levitical commandments, not the Pharisaic commandments that were like commandments upon commandments to protect, but no, like the original God-ordained oral commandments. God, Jesus never, ever broke one of them. And one of the biggest ones is in Exodus 20, which says, honor your father and mother. So we know he wasn't being disrespectful, right? We know that much. So what do we know? Theologians have wrestled through this and tried to unpack what this means. And they've typically landed on this idea that Jesus is pronouncing that the kingdom work is more important than family. And there's some new thought coming around there, and, and it's saying, yes, but it's a little bit deeper than that. A little bit deeper than that. And they tie it to Luke 9 and Luke 14. I won't go to both, but I'll bring you to Luke 14. This is where Jesus is talking to his disciples and asking, and they're asking, um, or disciples want to become disciples. Here's what happens. Large crowds are traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me he does, who does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This word hate, really like an aggressive word, isn't it? The word hate, if we look up it like in, in Webster's dictionary, would, the definition is what they say. They say uh, it is extreme dislike, right, or, or um, disgust. Like that's a, the association we have with the word hate. But what, what the word actually is, is, it's actually missio. And the word missio doesn't mean that. The word missio means to love less. 
or to put into second place. What Jesus is saying is that kingdom work takes precedence. What he's saying is that all the good things in life that we talked about to celebrate, you know, what? even the gift of family, which is a good thing. It's because of family and, and, and God's uh, importance on the family unit that God, he chose Abraham. So there is this idea that the family unit is important. But even in its importance, it comes secondary to kingdom work. And so the question is, have you counted the cost? Jesus goes on to say, he goes later on in the verse, he says, have you ever built a house and not actually done the math to figure out how much it's going to cost you? There, there was a, uh, in, in Victoria, when we lived there, there was a massive pit uh, in the middle of the city where it's actually in Langford. And, and it was probably close to like, I don't know, maybe eight or nine city blocks. And, and they had like started this project and they had dug this cave and it was, it was like gigantic. It, it dwarfs anything else in Kamloops. It was gigantic. I think they got up to like the concrete up to the first floor and it sat vacant. Like for the, it, it didn't move for the next, I think 10 or 15 years, it just sat there. What had happened was the funding never came, right? So, so all of a sudden you've, you're building this house, it comes up to like this high, it's supposed to be 30, 30, 40, 50 stories high, whatever it is, it gets to like the first story and it stops. There was no funding, the builder hadn't counted the cost. You look like a fool. And so that's what Jesus is saying. He's like, have you counted the cost of being my disciple? That's what he's asking. Do you know what's going to cost of you? What's going to call of you? It takes precedence. What are you willing to give up? Your desires, although they may be good, what are you willing to give up? What is your first love? What are you not willing to give up? Maybe that's a better question. What are you not willing to give up? You know, the, the, the question of what are you willing to give up is a really good question because it shows you what your first love actually is. See, I'd be willing to give up everything but not this. The money, the bank account, the promotion, my friends, the boat, my health. Whatever I'm not willing to put in subject to Christ, that is your first love. And so what Jesus is saying to Mary as she finds him, he's saying, look, I have found the cost. I've measured the cost, and I'm in my father's house, learning to study and understand his will. Have you counted the cost? Do we know what he's asking of us? To be his disciple. What Jesus are you looking for? That's the opening question. What Jesus are you looking for? There's going to be some of the room, and you're going to fall into, like I said, that 90% where you said, hey, look, I, I'm sure, great. Jesus, he was a historical figure. I get that. But you're probably close to the 50% where you say, look, I'm just, I'm out. It's okay. I want to push back and say the very question that your heart is asking is there for a reason. And the only thing that can fill it, but something needs to fill it, let's put it that way. And what Christianity offers is to say, look, there's a God who created your heart a certain way. There's a God who can fill your heart the way it's designed to be filled. And there's a God who understands what you've gone through. No other, no other philosophy, no other religion can offer that same level of intimacy. That he knows your, he created your heart for relationship with him. He can fill that void and he understands what it is to be you as a baby growing up. That you desire to have problems, you desire to have value and meaning in your life. A Harvard professor, James Wood, had an article earlier on in the New York. The title, is, the, the title of the article is all, Is That All There Is? And he's talking about a friend of his who's a philosopher. A convinced atheist, a philosopher, wakes up in the, and he says to his friend, his, this, this atheist philosopher, wakes up haunted with the following angst. This is what his friend says. How can it be that this world is the result of an accidental bang? How could it be no design, no metaphysical purpose? 
Can it be that every life, beginning with my own, my husband's, my children's, and spreading outward, is cosmically irrelevant? There is no purpose. You see, you don't like that. Nobody likes to live in this world without purpose. And that's by design. That's how he's designed your heart. To have purpose, but it's purpose with him. But if you don't know your creator, the architect of your heart, could it be that you are cosmically irrelevant? What does it look like for you to have purpose as you go into 2024? That purpose in your, in your life that is not more than simply just simply living, but there is actual purpose. That the, 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 the heart desire is filled. That there's an instruction manual for your heart. There's a tug in your heart. It tells you that something's missing. Some of you in this room, you've been going to church for a long time. But you just desire deeper intimacy with Jesus. You're like, I, I, I need to know my Father. There's a tug on your heart to know the Father. So Jesus says, how does your life relate to mine? As you see Jesus' life, even before his ministry, how does your life pair up against his? What are the rhythms and practices that you have to remind you of God's faithfulness to enjoy his creation? What does it mean to have a little bit more than just a superficial scanning of Scripture? I love that. That's so hard. That's hard to hear. A superficial scanning of Scripture. What means to have more than just simply on your own, but you have a group of people that help you and prod you and sharpen you and spur you on? What does Sabbath look like? And then there's going to be some of you in this room who said, look, you know what? I do Sabbath. I read scripture. I study scripture. I have a group of friends who help me. I, I live a life that honors God. So did Mary and Joseph. And they completely missed Jesus. You see, Mary and Joseph were probably doing all the things they were supposed to be doing. And they completely missed him. question is this morning are you missing him was it to know Jesus was it to, to be able to have intimacy with Jesus to not just check off the boxes but actually to live a life that is intimately connected to your Savior as we go into 2024 what is the one thing you're going to do different wherever you are what is the one thing how do you need how do you need an elephant one bite at a time. What is the one thing that you're going to do? Tonight. See, tonight I'm, I've had a long week. I've got, next week is going to be a little bit slower of a week for me. I'm going to be able to put my feet up for a bit, which I'm looking forward to. Tonight I'm going to have Olibola, which if you're not Dutch, you have no idea what that means. There's a few of us in the room who know what Olibola, basically they're like, a, they're like a donut on steroids but they're delicious. So that's me tonight. I'm going to put my feet up next week. But the nagging question is, what am I going to do different? Enjoy the Oli Bull. Enjoy the time with family. Enjoy all these things. Those are good things. But have you counted the cost and what are you going to do different? Just one thing. Just one thing.